Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Pagam Radian here at the Naval Submarine League's annual conference and trade show just outside Washington, D.C., the number one gathering of U.S. Navy submariners from around the world. And it's our honor to be talking to Rear Admiral Tom Ishii, uh, who is the N-97, the banker, or I should say the director of submarine uh -huh. warfare, but the banker as uh, uh, was referred to you in there, sir. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Fago. I'm very glad to be here. And, and I would say that uh, I am the banker, but I also am the requirements guy. So we typically in the building, we refer to that as requirements and resources or the right. war fighter and right. the banker. Uh, exactly, uh, because without that one yin, there, there is no uh, yang. Um, I don't know where I was going with that. Let me ask you a CR-related question that goes more to uh, that side of the uh, equation. Obviously, we're under a continuing resolution that's very, very restrictive. There are people in Washington who are very uh, comfortable at this point with a full year continuing resolution. Talk to us about the near term as well as the long term impact you're facing. Uh, sure. So really, the, you know, the big problem is that we're executing this year's strategy and priorities with last year's budget, and they're not matched up. And so, for example, some of the new starts that we have this year, which is uh, doing some things in the hypersonic area that could be delayed until the uh, CR is able to finish and uh, if the CR goes long enough that might really reduce our ability to get to where we need to be in this year and that priority. Uh, the other areas in readiness and maintenance uh, those areas have burn rates that are based uh, right now because of the CR on last year's burn rates and uh, it may not it may not match up very well to what we had intended to do this year. And uh, what are the implications if it goes full year? If it goes a full year, uh, we would we could possibly even uh, be delayed in production of some of our larger uh, pieces of equipment, such as a, a, a submarine or some of our uh, large uh, UUVs. Um, when you uh, look at the maintenance backlog right now, you were commanding officer of Key West. Key West is one of the ships that's uh, in the yard. One of the key things to get to that 66 uh, submarine requirement is to get ships through the shipyard faster, but we've had some like Helena that have been in there for a very, very long time. Uh, Connecticut, Jefferson City, Chicago, it's a, it's a long list. Um, and some of the priority is now going to the carriers, which is pushing the submarines further back. How are you getting that workload? How are you going to eat through it to get that capability out to the force? Because you're the number one asset everybody wants. Yeah, this is the number one priority. The submarine force commander right now, as far as force generation, is getting that backlog uh, eaten down and, and getting those submarines returned to sea where they need to be for training and operations. And so we're looking at this in a number of different ways. It's a it's a whole Navy focus. It's not just the submarine force. Obviously, we team up with the shipyards here. Uh, and one of the big uh, uh, items that we've done recently is really look hard at the infrastructure of the shipyards. Do we have the right equipment? Do we have the right people, the right trade skills? And uh, we, we think we've identified some areas. We have resourced uh, some infrastructure improvements, and we think we're headed in the right direction there. The other side of it is to be able to understand in our processes where we could improve and so there's two efforts uh, ongoing there. One is to look at the metrics for the overall availability process so that when we can see ahead of time where we're going to have problems and we can uh, uh, proactively apply the necessary resources to get us through that. Uh, and then the other is to look at the actual physical processes in the shops and the shipyards and to make sure that those are optimized to, to do those as efficiently as possible. Um, when you, uh, one of the key uh, elements of this as you talked in your uh, presentation is about ultra large uh, unmanned vehicles of all shapes and sizes, submarine force, very, very comfortable with those for a very long period of time. Uh, extraordinary test recently to get um, a, a Razorback in and out of a torpedo tube autonomously, which was uh, successful. Do you have a better idea now in terms of what that unmanned fleet, I think folks are a little bit further along on the payload side of things. Are you comfortable where the, the kind of full suite the Navy needs for the undersea uh, challenges of the future? Well, we have had some recent uh, victories in the, the UUV world, and we're starting to field some of the uh, the products that have been in test and development, and they're going into low rate of initial production. Uh, and we're, we're pretty happy with those capabilities. Where we really need to focus is the integration of those capabilities into the submarine as a weapon system. So making this a system of systems where we can plan and execute missions uh, from manned uh, submarines or other vehicles using these uh, unmanned 
undersea vehicles and go out and, and achieve the objectives that we need to in the undersea domain. Uh, so to that extent, I think in the next five years, we'll be focusing a lot on the command and control and communication aspect of these uh, UUVs. Uh, as I mentioned in there, we see the UUV vehicle itself as a truck that we should be able to put whatever capability that we want, whether that's a sensor or a weapon. And now we just need to be able to link all of those uh, different sensors and weapons together in a coherent manner so that uh, we can employ these. And the sooner we get them into the water, the better, because then we can spiral and prove them as uh, we're going forward. Um, it's an extraordinary uh, period of renaissance for the submarine force. Uh, obviously, we've got the Virginia payload module versions of the uh, Virginia class uh, going out, Columbia program. Uh, you know, we heard uh, great briefs uh, on that in terms of capability, the unmanned vehicles. The entire uh, both sensor and battle networking grid is going to be integral piece to actually uh, realize this. The amount of data you're going to handle, have to handle and move, whether from seafloor all the way up uh, to space, you're going to have many more things that are trying to communicate and trying to communicate in a communications denied environment because some of our adversaries want to degrade us whether through kinetic effects or electronic effects. Talk to us about how you're thinking and architecting uh, or, or building this sort of communications uh, data and information architecture that's going to be absolutely key. Yeah, uh, so we're just really starting out on this, and of course a lot of the work is at the classified level, but we know a few things. We know we need to be able to to uh, tap into the, the Navy tactical grid. So what our, our surface forces and our air forces are doing uh, and our Marine Corps forces, we need to be all connected up to that. So that'll be a big piece of it. And then as you point out, we uh, will likely be in a comms denied environment. We have to take that into account. Uh, one thing about submarines, we're kind of used to being in a comms denied environment in that the communications are very different uh, underwater than they are up in the in the air and the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, so we have some ideas there. Can't talk in any detail about those. Um, let me ask one last question. Uh, Chaz Richard, the commander of the submarine force, going to be the next uh, STRATCOM commander, talked about um, how the submarine force really is on that war footing now, is, um, you know, in a highly competitive, you know, we've heard that for everybody in the community for a number of years as that transition has happened. You were joining the force, uh, you know, at the tail end of, of the Cold War. Talk to us about how everybody's got to be thinking differently about an environment where we're no longer the person exclusively with the ability to go to the seafloor, for example, or to have some of the capabilities that we've long counted on. How's, what's the mindset change uh, when you have adversaries that can go everywhere we can and actually have some advantages and have actually demonstrated they're willing to rattle our cage every now and then? Yeah, so uh, that, that's a very good question and it is a different mindset. You really are on a a combat footing every day and then we hope we never have to go into combat but the best way to not go into combat is to be ready to go into combat and, and that's the the essence of deterrence so day to day we have to to own the best technologies we have to have the best tactical doctrine and at the end of the day it's going to come down to the innovation and learning of our our leaders our, our commanding officers that are in command of our submarines and command of our ships in command of our uv squadrons and their ability to adapt to changing conditions so that's really what Admiral Richard has been focused on in the last year is inculcating uh, in our training opportunities to put our, our leaders, our tactical leaders into situations that are uncomfortable or uh, unknown to them to let them to get used to operating in that uh, combat environment. And uh, one last lighthearted question. Uh, you were aboard Narwhal, which was one of the coolest uh, submarines in the inventory. Uh, certainly a very, very unique boat. You were aboard Tunney and Sea Devil 637s uh, forever with an S5W uh, reactor. What made, uh, and you commanded Key West, obviously, and I think you were on La Jolla also. Uh, talk to us about why 637s, or Narwhal in particular, was so cool. Well, Narwhal was a unique ship. It had a lot of new capabilities, uh, and it was extremely quiet ship. Uh, I just went to the reunion of the USS Narwhal a couple of weekends ago in Charleston, South Carolina, and there's still a very, uh, very active group. Of course, it goes back to the World War II submarine USS Narwhal, and we have great connections there. Uh, but it, is, it was a fantastic experience for me, and that the uniqueness aspects of that ship, some of which uh, we we haven't replicated today, are, are, are still kind of the the highlight of my technical career in the Navy. Yeah, and a very quiet geared turbine setup you guys uh, had in that <laughs> ship, which was uh, which was fascinating. Tom Ishii, uh, the Director of Submarine Warfare for the United States Navy, the N-97, for both requirements and resources. Sir, honor and pleasure, and look forward to talking again soon. Thank you very much, Vago. Appreciate it.